that the outstanding academic speakers are chaired by outstanding members of the broader legal profession that straddle the boundaries between practice and academia. And today, we are particularly, particularly delighted to have is with us Professor Christine Chinkin, FBA, CMG, Global Law Professor in Michigan, formerly Professor of International at LSC, now Professorial Research Fellow at the Center for Women, Peace and Security at the LSC, a prolific author. I think that we have all read and cited and recommended her work for years. Also a prolific practitioner within international law, a member of the Human Rights Advisory Panel in Kosovo for six years, advisor to the drafting committee of the Istanbul Convention, and counsel or expert in cases before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, if might just say the modesty of Professor Chinkin, she doesn't even mention that she has been a counsel in International Court of Justice cases. What other international lawyer would just not plan that? And she was elected executive chair of the ILA in November 2021. We are really, really delighted, Professor Chinkin, to have you as the chair, please. Over to me. Okay, thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, for that very warm introduction. Very odd having an introduction to the chair who then introduces the speaker. But anyway, that's the way it is. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to uh, introduce Dina. And uh, now the way you were greeting everybody in the room, I get the feeling I don't really need to introduce you very much to very many people here. But for those that don't know, um, Dr. Dina Chubala A is from that right? That's exactly right. Thank you. Uh, is from the Australian National University College of Law. And I think what we all ought to say big congratulations about is that your book, Capitalism as Civilization, The History of International Law, won the prestigious 2022 Hazel Certificate of Merit for a preeminent contribution to creative scholarship. So I think give a clap for that one. <laughs> I'm acting now on the sorts of themes that you're going to be talking to us about on this uh, lecture on aggression, capitalism, and international law, missed opportunities or structural constraints. So over to you, Josh. Thank you very, very much uh, to Professor Chinking, uh, whose work has been some, nothing short of inspiring and life-changing uh, when it comes to my own scholarship. Many thanks to Martin Spoparinskis, both for inviting me, but also for his extreme grace when I postponed on a number of occasions. Uh, the reason I postponed partly was because I was really, really uh, committed to doing this lecture in person. Uh, first, because I had been uh, tired of seeing my face on the screen, uh, but secondly, because of, of this, right, of the feeling of being in a room with other uh, colleagues and friends and being able to share these thoughts with you. Of course, I'm also very grateful to people who have uh, uh, logged on to Zoom. So my aim for the next 35 minutes, I hope it's 35, I haven't timed it, is to persuade you about three things. First, that the political economy of war and conflict in the most immediate sense, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that, should be a matter of concern, both for international lawyers, but also for everyone who cares about peace. Secondly, I want to persuade you that the economic structures that fuel and facilitate war are not currently an issue that international law understood here to involve both positive international law, but also scholarly production, has nothing, anything meaningful to say about in this present juncture. And finally, the recovering a legal tradition of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis military budgets, armaments, and war profiteering is a pursuit that it is worthy as much as it is not straightforward. This tradition that I alluded to is particularly, I think, relevant today as military spending is once again on the rise. After a short period of decline following the deprioritization of the so-called war on terror by the United States, the war in Ukraine and more broadly, the re-emergence of great power competition is accompanied by a marked rise of war spending around the world within every single continent with a notable exception for now of Africa. 
According to the in in estimates of the Stockholm International Research Institute, in 2022, military expenditure globally rose by 3.7% in real terms, reaching a record high of 2,240 billion US dollars. This is the sort of amount that is just so big that it stops making sense, right? Just how much money that is. The United States accounts for over, of, or over one third of the spending, followed by China, whose spending might be dwarfed by that of the US for now. But China claims the questionable honor of being the only state since we've been keeping track whose budget has increased for 28 to eight consecutive years. We are then clearly in the midst of an arms race. And I think it is imperative to ask, what is the political economic function of this war spending that I just described? In so doing, in my view, it is important to differentiate between two variations of the argument of thinking, what is this political economic function? Um, on the one hand, one approach focuses um, on the particularistic interest of some factions of capital and some classes, while other approaches emphasize the long-term systematic interest of capitalism as a social system. The former position is often summarized as a concern or, or, uh, about or as a position to the so-called industrial military complex, military industrial complex rather. The argument goes like this. Certain factions of capital, including traditional defense contractors, but also more recently, other industries such as logistics, private security, tech companies, and others, have managed to capture, to capture the state. And they use bloated defense budgets like the one I described, and constant war preparedness as a means both of securing profit rates higher than market average, as well as as a way of extraordinary yields in financial markets. In addition, war and national security operated as spaces of class formation and reproduction. State bureaucrats, skilled tech professionals, engineers, security consultants, regional experts, Middle East, regional experts come to mind, and importantly, for this room, lawyers rely on this political economy for the reproduction of their class positions, including high salaries, as well as status and power. Historically, at least, military spending also led to the creation of relatively well-paid and secure working class jobs, at least in developed states, particularly in the United States. However, technological advances, the rise of neoliberalism, and the relocation of many of these industries in the southern states of the United States has led to a marked decline of these high paying working class jobs, even though regional reliance on military spending for employment persists. Combined with the fact the defense spending and war in the last 30 or so years have been financed through borrowing and not through taxes, this political economy has benefited capital, but also part of the professional classes, the former as receptors, of course, of generous contracts, and the latter as both salaried professionals, but also as holders of national debt. The problem then for me is that if economic power is relative, then inflated military budgets empower this section of society that have a material interest in war to the detriment of those who would benefit for peace, thereby making the attainment of the latter more difficult. Military spending, unlike in some other progressive critical tradition, need to be thought of in terms of what, not what it crowds out, but what it crowds in, in terms of the structures of powers that it creates and how these structures are hostile to peace. As I have already indicated to all, this approach that focuses on distribution
of thinking about the political economy of war and militarism. Rather, at least since the interwar period, so it's getting on for 100 years, Marxists and Keynesians and other heterodox economists have been arguing about the systematic effects of military spending, about its importance for capitalism as a whole, rather about particular classes within capitalism. Sometimes referred to as military Keynesianism, this was an expression that had fallen out of fashion. You see it circulating again. Unfortunately, I shouldn't be smiling. This theory is distinct, is related, but I think it's distinct from concerns about the military industrial complex insofar as it does not center particularistic class interests, but rather the microeconomic effects of such spending. To understand military Keynesianism, of course, one needs to understand Keynesianism. Keynes's basic policy prescription was that public expenditure, for example, in the form of public works, could create full employment or near full employment and ensure that demand for goods and services was high and steady enough for entrepreneurs to invest rather than saving and therefore avoid or move out of an economic downturn. Even though Keynes did not necessarily dwell upon the microeconomic or social effects of different types of public investment, he was keenly aware that this public expenditure could be directed towards socially useful ends. Think of the Green New Deal or calls about for a Green New Deal. Socially useless purposes, digging up holes, filling them up again, or socially destructive purposes, notably armaments and war. The concern then of Marxist, left-wing Keynesians and other heterodox economists has been that for a number of reasons, capitalist states would and do gravitate towards the final category, towards socially destructive forms of public investment. Heterodox economies, such as um, the Polish economist Michael Kalensky, argued, for example, that socially useful expenditure was likely to be opposed by capitalism insofar as it either it encroached on their existing spheres of profitability or because it enhanced the negotiating power of the working classes by partially decommodifying life. The capitalist class as a whole, then Kalensky said, tends to upon public subsidizing of life, for example, generous unemployment benefits, public houses, subsidies for essential commodities, family support benefits, etc., insofar as they enhance the negotiating power of working classes whose survival and even thriving becomes partly delinked from their wages. This capitalist resistance against socially progressive forms of public service even if it leads to full employment and generalized prosperity, makes such problems programs politically hard to execute. And as I would say, experience has shown, difficult to sustain in the long run. Kalensky also argued that military spending was preferable to social spending from a capitalist point of view for another reason, and a reason that I think is of particular interest to international lawyers. Kalensky argues that military spending operates as a spontaneous form of coordination in the absence of a formal method of coordination between national government. His argument went like this. If implemented on a national level, robust public spending and investment will lead to significant trade deficits as demands for investment and consumption good rises leading to increased imports. This may or may not be an issue for states, the United States is the example here, whose currency is the hegemonic international currency, and therefore they can sustain long-term trade deficits, but it is for everyone else. However, Kalensky argued, this problem would not arise 
if other states also implemented comparable expenditure problems, thereby leading to an intensified cross-border trade overall, but without major trade imbalances. In a fragmented world of states that are in competition with each other, though, there is no guarantee that this coordination will happen either spontaneously or through some form of formal political coordination. However, he said, increased military spending by one state tends to trigger similar behavior from others as states engage in armed races, such as the one we are witnessing today. Kalensky was writing um, these things in, in, in the early years of the Cold War, right? But the parallels, I think, with today are almost too obvious to state in this room. We are witnessing the most serious challenge to the neoliberal model in the past 40 years, and many progressive commentators hail the so-called return of the state and the de-demonization of industrial policy, at least in the developed world, including an increased and vocal concern for inequality and organized labor. I never thought I would see Joe Biden joining a picket line, and I have seen that all. I've now seen Joe. At the same time, as many have argued, it is impossible to disentangle this entanglement from geopolitical competition and even increase belligerency between especially the US and China. It is an imperative to ensure that this return of the state is not primarily achieved through a further expansion of the defense sector, accompanied by increased militarism and competition that would render some form of value of widespread armed confrontation or but certain. Again, you might have seen in the recent weeks, Joe Biden saying that one of the reasons to keep exporting um, weapons to Ukraine and to Israel is because they create well-paid American jobs. However, this is going to be my second argument for today. I'm concerned when I hear that. And my argument is that international law is, as of November 2023, profoundly inequipped to deal with this challenge. This is because the political economy of war and militarism is hard to describe, let alone to regulate through the idioms of international law. As I will show, I hope, later in this presentation, some of these limitations are structural and they're linked to the very nature of both law and capitalism. However, structural limitations do not negate the fact that there's something unique about our contemporary lack of ambition. Indeed, in the aftermath of the Second World War and during the Cold, Cold, War, Cold War, we witnessed important efforts to name, address, and even eliminate this political economy of war, an effort that was widely seen as a prerequisite of saving succeeding generations from the scrounge of war. Perhaps paradoxically, I would say definitely paradoxically, one of the most ambitious efforts to do so took place in the realm of international criminal law. And I'm saying this is paradoxic because this is a field that has been often, and I think rightly been criticized for its inability to conceive of the structural causes of war and violence. However, these efforts did exist in the immediate effort, uh, aftermath of World War II, involving efforts of the prosecution to put to trial and prosecute German capitalists um, for a number of crimes, including, and that I think is important, the crime of aggression. These efforts failed, especially in regards to, kind of, to the crime of aggression. And this failure can be read as a story of contingency especially in the form of prosecutorial mistakes that resulted in lost time. To take a step back, towards the end of World War II, there was a clear consensus amongst the Allies, at least amongst the US and USSR. Britain was a little bit more shaky about that. Um, the German aggression and genocide could and should be understood in economic terms. And in particular, as a result, of the political and economic interests of German trusts and cartels. 
regardless of whether one saw German industry as symptomatic of differ, deeper inescapable problems of capitalism, of where, as the Soviets did, for example, also whether one thought that these industrialists had perverted and corrupted capitalism as the US side of the prosecution thought, it was beyond doubt that legal responses to war and aggression should target them too. This turned out to be easier said than done. The decision to charge Gustav Krupp um, in, in the context of the Nuremberg trials was inopportune since the aging man was found to be unfit to stand trials and efforts to replace him with his son, Alfred Krupp, in the last minute were blocked due to staunch British objections. Therefore, the prosecution of German capitalism was deferred to the so-called subsequent trials, which were convicted by individual allied forces and in particular by the US and France. As others have noted, by the time that these trials were in full swing, Cold War divisions can began to solidify, and therefore Western allies were reluctant to prosecute and convict, convict German capitalists for fear of these convictions serving as Soviet propaganda against capitalism, but also because the United States was concerned about securing the cooperation of its own capitalists for its overseas ambitions. In this climate, the lax treatment, everyone was out of jail by 1945, and actually everyone went back to their business, um, of German capitalists can be very plausibly read as the result of the tribunal selective and often I would say outrageous treatment of the fact. <clears throat> and that's not something that goes to the core of legal doctrine or reasoning as such. I don't think that's quite true. And the IG Farben case is instructive, not least because it was one of the only two subsequent trials that involved specifically charges of aggression against capitalism. Eventually, all defendants were acquitted in regards to counts one and five that concerned crimes against peace. These acquittals hinged on the tribunal's positions position that the defendants had no specific knowledge of the plan to wage aggressive war. In turn, this finding depended on defendants like Krau not having specifically attended a small number of meetings with Hitler and more broadly on a reconstruction of the role of Fabian executives as operating purely on an everyday economic and technocratic level, while decision-making according to the tribunals in regards to aggressive war was constructed at taking place at an entirely different level of governance and only involving a very small number of political leaders. Judge Herbert wrote a concurring opinion which actually reads much more like a dissenting one. Indeed, it was a dissenting one until at the very end that primarily challenged this construction of the facts by the tribunal's majority. For example, Judge Herbert's opinion highlighted the close relationship of the lead dependent Karl Krauch with Goering himself, the former central role in Germany's four-year plan and war preparation, as well as Farben's systematic preparation for the war and active role in Nazi propaganda and espionage overseas. Herbert's, Judge Herbert's account then was much more granular than that of the majority, highlighting concrete instances of economic decision making by Farben executives that were very hard to interpret without assuming specific knowledge of the plan to wage aggressive war. In contrast, the majority opinion relied on much more conceptual forms of reading, abstract forms of reasoning that relied on the fundamental disjunction I have alluded to between waging of war on the other, on the one hand, that was seen as a political decision, and the everyday operations of Farben that were understood as motivated by ordinary business consideration, meaning and the direct pursuit of profit or the shielding of the corporation from negative political ramification. 
despite, I would say, though their difference of both Afghans, so Herbert and the majority, they both relied on this idea of mere economic decision making and normal business as being by definition not enough to establish specific knowledge and intent. The tribunal's majority rejected without argument, it did so in half a line, the concept of the cartels, German cartels, as either descriptive of urban operations or as explanatory of its power, political and, and economic. The tribunal insisted that there was no evidence, for example, that Farben used its agreement with overseas corporations, notably Standard Oil, to sabotage technological program, progress excuse me, in critical war materials and to gather information about the state of the art in other nations. One of the central arguments to this end was that the licensing system used by Farben was legal under domestic and international patent laws. Judge Herbert's account of the events questioned that that was the case, that it was legal. Um, and when it came to knowledge sharing between Fabian and overseas contractor, regardless of the factual disagreement though, I would say, this is a remarkable statement insofar as it evacuates discussions about property law in this instance, intellectual property, from all discussions about power, even though creating power to withhold information is precisely what IP law are meant to do, is meant to do. The debatable then lawfulness of these practices does not preclude either as a matter of conceptual thinking or as a matter of historical record, in any way, the possibility that property rights were used in ways that strategically obstructed or facilitated the flow of knowledge in ways that ultimately enabled Farben and the Third Reich to wage aggressive war. But this was pretty much made unthinkable by the tribunal. This reassertion then of a sharp distinction between property and sovereignty and more broadly between economic and political power runs through the tribunal's ruling as a whole. On the one hand, of course, is conceptualized as a matter of high politics and indeed as one limited to an increasingly narrowing cycle of its circle of individuals. On the other economic relations, as structured through property contracts and other laws, as understood to be, in the words of the tribunals, at most that of followers, <laughs> not leaders, as law and the economy are voided of all considerations of power, political intentionality, and political violence. In turn, I would say, this distinction was made possible by the elision of the role of property and power within the economy itself. So not only political power and economical power is separate, but power doesn't exist within the economy. Let me explain what it is like that. The tribunal famously relied on a slippery slope argument, asserting that if they convicted the defendants, they would have to find guilty the mass a, the great mass of Germans who participated even in small ways in the role, effort. This rhetorical move made, in my view, invisible two things. First, that the concentrated economic power of Farben and other executives made their cooperation infinitely more impactful than that of ordinary citizens citizens, a fact that is of clear interest if you're a criminal lawyer, both to the doctrine of criminal law, but also to the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. Secondly, the judges elided the fact that Farben, Krupp, and other major industrial cartels had the unique power to use property, contract, and other legal paralegal and even illegal arrangement in order to solicit the cooperation of millions. In the context of concentrated industries in particular, a small number of individuals are able to combine, command, combine and direct the labor, property, 
productive energies and resources of thousands, if not millions. Um, millions of people, sorry, through the power that law, administration, habit and political power bestow upon them. In other words, the reasoning of the military tribunal negated the power of concentrated injury, a industry, pun intended, born within the political architecture of the right and within German economy as its slippery slope argument relied on an undifferentiated, indifferentiated image of economy, of thinking about the economy as a flat structure that made no, dis no distinction, no meaningful distinction between people working for a wage at pain of starvation and those who by way of controlling the means of production and subsistence are able to control and direct the labor of the former toward particular economic and political ends, including aggressive war. In this respect, contemporary commentators, people writing today, are right to stress that both the international military tribunals and the subsequent trials did not rule out the possibility of capitalists being found guilty of the crime of aggression as a matter of abstract legal principle and general pronoun pr pronouncements. However, I would say this emphasis of abstract legal principles overlooks, fatally overlooks, the concrete reasoning of these military tribunals. And in particular, what I have described already, namely their argumentative efforts to reinstate property and, eco property and economy as conceptually separated from war and violence. If anything, I would say few historical examples support the legal realist suspicion that general principles do not decide concrete cases as robustly as the case of German industrialists, where the conceptual possibility of guilt was undermined by the argumentative reality of the political innocence of property. Even if international criminal law once held some fleeting promise, about regulating and sanctioning the political economy of war, I think we have good reasons to be skeptical about its ability to do so. Fantastic, I'm almost up. <laughs> As uh, to do so today. As Kevin John Heller has argued, for example, the decision of the drafters of the Kambala Amendment that only individuals in court direction or control of state decision-making can commit the crime of aggression has raised the bar considerably in comparison to Nuremberg, which has opted for the more flexible standard of shape or influence. More fundamentally, progressive abolitionist thinkers and activists um, have been critical about the use of criminal law, including international criminal law, as a tool for peace and justice more broadly. At the very least, even if you don't buy the abolitionist argument, the retrospective character of international criminal law is especially inadequate in the case of war and aggression, where prevention should be our main commitment, as the lives of millions are at stake. None of this means, though, in my view, that law, including international law, does not have a role to play in confronting and undoing the political economy of war. UN Charter Articles 11 and 26 give the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council respectively the authority to lay out the general direction in the case of the Assembly and the details in the case of the Council of disarmament. Even though the General Assembly has been making use of these powers, Article 26 remains roundly, largely unused since the early stages of the Cold War. <clears throat> One, of course, need not be naive about the possibility of the P5, who are also the big spenders when it comes to war budgets, making use of this provision. However, I would say the sheer existence of this provision can operate as a locus for political mobilization and advocacy, especially with the assistance of sympathetic states. 
This is not unprecedented. In 2008, Costa Rica, which as you might know is a uniquely demilitarized state, used its status as a non-permanent member to remind the council of its responsibilities under Article 26. Costa Rica situated these efforts within the broader euphoria at the time, I don't know if you remember it, um, of the end of the Cold War and the promise of an effective multilateral system. In retrospect, of course, we can see that this core came at the tail end of the euphoric liberal international order. As geopolitical competition intensifies from the Pacific to Eastern Europe, and as the humanitarian pretenses of the international legal order collapse under the rumble in Gaza, or man might be inclined to look back at Costa Rica's initiative with a healthy dose of cynicism. However, at the same time, I would say, as we also witness protesters attempting to disrupt or at least to highlight the complicity of Western weapons manufacturers and exporters with Israel's onslaught, ongoing onslaught against Gaza, I'm inclined to think that cynicism might be quite as harmful as cruel optimism, namely the attachment to things that are actually detrimental to our flourishing. Rather, we need an intellectually granular and politically situated account of how war, political economy and international law come together in ways that I would say sometimes are structural and unavoidable, save for radical change, and sometimes contingent and malleable, and therefore up for grants with, for grabs within the current balance of power. Even though I'm not arguing that this talk accomplished any of these goals, I'm hoping that it was the first step towards such a direction. Thank you for your attention. Extremely rich and very thoughtful, I think, account. Uh, I'm sure it's made all of you think about a lot of things. <laughs> um, one, obviously, just how topical it is, and that's clearly uh, where you finish. But you began by saying, I'm now abusing the position of chair by asking the first question. <laughs> um, but you began by saying that all those who care about heats should be concerned with the arguments that you're putting forward. And that makes me think, does international law actually <laughs> care about peace? Is international law in any way at all, leaving aside whether it's structurally able to do so, does it care about peace? How many of you who study international <laughs> law have ever had a class that says, let's put peace at the center of international law? We have classes on aggression, we have classes on conflict, we have classes on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But do we have classes on peace? do we think about how international law might actually contribute to peace? So my question to you is, <laughs> does international law care about peace? If it doesn't, despite you know the great words, all those um, to despair because the succeeding generations will be scared, you know, the great sort of centerpiece of the charter. But then to move slightly on, probably what you're expecting me to ask, mm -hmm. is the, I mean, there's a major critique of militarism, arms race, um, the call for universal and comprehensive disarmament that comes through the feminist literature, through the gender lens, through feminist advocacy and activism since at least 1915. In fact, you can trace it way further back. Is, is there, can we bring your critique and the gender critique together? I mean, surely, again, if we want to try and get through cynicism and optimism, we need to have concerted you know, uh, challenges to it. So, peace, international law, gender. Thank you so much, uh, Ed. Yeah, that's why I've wanted you to be preparing this because I do think this is also a story about gender and about the history of feminism within international law and governance, right? You could, I could say exactly the same story as mm -hmm. the story of the frustration of many feminists yeah. in being sometimes very directly, not by implication, asked to drop the disarmament agenda Absolutely. in order to be incorporated in the gender, peace and security agenda, right? And there is a lot of testimony of people working in and around Geneva and New York being told that you, you cannot be a serious interlocutor 
for as long as you problematize um, um, ma armament and military budgets, right? In the most explicit no, and unequivocal um, terms. But I do at the same time, I agree with you that this is, it's not perhaps the dominant tradition within governance feminism and international war, but it is a long standing um, tradition that has problematized um, these forms of, of spending. And I do think it can be um, recovered, but of course it would require a bit of thinking um, about feminist work within the structures of international war. To what extent the gender, peace and security agenda has been helpful and to what extent it has been directly detrimental and a direct de-radicalizing force, right? To what extent did international law become feminist or feminists become yeah. <laughs> international law-ish yeah. in, in, in that sense? Which also takes me to, to the point, does international law care about peace? Yes, I mean, looking at the world the past two months, the answer would be not too much, right? Yeah. It, it's remarkable how easily the language of international law can be used and has been used to, to justify an incredibly accelerated form of violence that yeah. we are seeing in Gaza, Absolutely. right? The fact that you can describe this as plausibly legal. At the same time, again, and that's maybe I'm becoming conservative in my old age, um, I think there is, you know, it's, I do also think that this is a contradictory project and it does have elements within it that can be yielded. I do think that it is shocking how under discussed Article 26 is mm. because it doesn't give um, the Security Council just the right to talk about disarmament, it gives it the responsibility it creates some form of a legal obligation and disarmament is stopped off in the charter, not of oh, a little bit of nuclear weapons, a little bit of biological weapons, what are we doing with autonomous weapons? It's thought of in terms of general disarmament. Yeah. All armaments are thought of as politically and legally suspect. And to me, this is something, it might not work. Um, um, things don't seem to work lately, but I'm like, maybe let's give it a red hot go. Let's try to remind the council that this obligation is there and it's an illegal obligation. And let them have, on a political level, because it one need not be politically naive, the political burden of saying we don't want to do it. Yeah. Right. And I don't think it can be done separately or it cannot lead the people who are doing the activist work on the ground and they're trying, you know, going to ports, trying to stop shipments. I don't think the law can come before that, but I think it can be one tool in a broader political structure. Right. That's <laughs> uh, other questions. What I'll do is take um, several and then we'll turn it back. I think we've got about, probably about a uh, quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. Uh, for discussion. So hands are going up. So I'll go there, then there, then there. We'll take four. So there. Uh, thanks uh, very much. There. Um, there. Alison Jasper, University of Melbourne. Um, so I I um, keep the questions fairly short. I yes. know I but <laughs> yes, no, no. Of course. One thing I was going to say is I remember when international law was the law of peace and the law of war, and that's how it was taught. Yeah. Um, but coming to the question, where would you place these current debates about nuclear disarmament into this whole um, discussion that you're having? Because as you know, there are many uh, very close to where you live. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just on this um, question of what international law is going to say when, um, my intuition is that the post-45 lack of ambition is directly related by those who are crafting policy to the shadow of mutual war experience. And even those really deeply committed to disarmament found the intellectual dimensions of that and the challenge of making that connection between arms accumulation and hostility quite difficult. So I, I think we're swerving questions if we don't grapple with that shadow. And just a counterpoint to Father trial. I completely accept that account of the trial, but there's this interesting parallel of the European colonial still community in the Schumann Declaration, which is a laser threat on political economy. 
So they stay hidden under the surface. Yeah. 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 Somebody yes. There. Fantastic card. Thank you. Thank you. Just Corsi City University. I'm sorry. Yes. A fantastic talk. Thank you, Jessica Corsi City University of London. Thank you for focusing us on Article 26. I'm really curious where else you see openings, political openings, legal openings. The first question was about bringing together different movements. Will we always be factional? Will we always be, you know, ICL's response here, human rights response here, environmental litigation here, state responsibility there? Will we be looking at joining domestic, the IP, the contract, the economic critiques? Will we have a banner? Will we be working from different angles? Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. A brilliant, brilliant talk. Very much. I love the way you link between the past and the present. Which I have a slightly nerdy question um, about uh, totalitarian monopolies. In the discussion of the Barbara case, which I'm not that familiar with, um, it sounded as if they were trying to draw a distinction that Ernest Frankel were in treating the issue with states. Between the ordinary economy of the world state. And there was always a debate between him and Neumann yeah. that this is totalitarian and not being capitalism. We are not. The two books are published at the same time. Like, and I always thought that Frankel would count maybe better analytically, but it sounds like it comes from the cost. And maybe, maybe, maybe on, on, on a monetary ground, he would prefer the account which took into. Uh, took seriously about that. These were this was monopolization. It wasn't just the ordinary economy. So would you, would you agree with that assessment? Thank you. And I think there's one more. I'll take this last one at this point. Yeah. <laughs> at this stage. Yeah. Hi, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Um, thank you for the support for this information. I want to ask you all just one. Just one. Yeah. And, and now that's been very good case with company that's in Ukraine. Uh, would you think it's just a uh, is neutralist uh, maneuver to justify war or the law should not be done? Thank you. Some very rigid questions and quite challenging ones. What a lovely but, idea. Yeah, over to you. I'll start with Alison. And yeah, as you say, like the, um, nuclear weapons are such a live issue in the Pacific. So I am in two minds about this. On the one hand, I do think that it brings a sensibility and an ambition that goes so much further than the non-proliferation that is to be celebrated and it is, and it has been, especially as you say in the Pacific, a live issue that I think also had, confronts very core imperialist strategies and practices in the Pacific. So that is the aspect that I would say it rhymes with a lot of the things I've mentioned. The flip side of that, which I alluded to, uh, Professor Chinkin's question is, at the same time, there is something to that gives me pause about the singling out of particular forms of armaments, right? That this sort of breaking down of the disarmament ambition into certain forms of arms that we think about as particularly bad, which always has the implication that there are some other forms of arms that are not so bad. Right. And that is, I think, it's it's in a sense how disarmament worked out for practical purposes. And it has created path dependencies that I cannot discursively unravel because I wrote this. But I do think at the same time, there is value in holding on to the idea of total and complete disarmament and that all arms all armaments above a certain level are dangerous for peace, even if they're not nukes or AI or killer robots. I wouldn't even say I have a certain <laughs> level. I'm, I'm, happy to to it. It. I'm happy to consider yeah. that. Which take me actually to Megan's question. So this concern that you mentioned is, for example, the reason why there's nothing as ambitious in the charter as the League of Nations. But actually, if you go and look at the discussions happening during the Cold War about disarmament, they were actually extremely ambitious. Even if the way that they would feed into policy making were very limited. I read um, pages upon pages. Or, so first, there was a disarmament panel in Azel every single year of the Cold War. It was a live issue that people were debating. So actually this concern did not work out as a lack of ambition in the Cold War. And it was also very ambitious within professional associations. So you would see like the 
ILA had this meeting in the 60s in which disarmament was the main focus. And it's incredible to see the Soviets, the Americans, and the Yugoslavs basically saying what you said, which is we need total disarmament. And the question is, how will we organize international affairs when total disarmament happens? They treated this as an actual serious realistic discussion you can have, right? Which I would say if we if someone told me let's have this discussion now, we'd be like, come on, guys, this is like mm -hmm. so I would say interestingly, um disarmament remains a live issue in international law until the 80s and the 90s, and in much more ambitious terms. Um, than the, the fragmented way we are having them um, today. So I don't think that necessarily the experience of World War II killed that um, impetus, even though it did lead us through the fact to, to particularly water down um, Article 11 and Article 26 in comparison to whatever the, the article is in the uh, League of Nations, which takes me to, to your point, is there a way of bringing this efforts together? So I would say fragmentation is a factor of international lawyers' life, and again, I don't think that's a river we can get out of. We can work with it, and I think we can work smartly with it. But I do think one way that is perhaps slightly more systemic would be another of the arguments that was circulating during the Cold War and the ICJ killed with the nuclear weapons advisor opinion was that a certain level of armament is a threat to use force. And it's therefore prohibited under Article 2, Paragraph 4, right? And this is an argument that was being made not just about nukes, it was being made in the interwar period about all armament. And obviously the ice a day kills it. it. I don't, but my point is, did it kill it in 1996? Because I think there's arguments to be made that this is a very peculiar advisory opinion with a divided court and so on and so forth. And I do think there is ways to resurrect that argument, right? And of course, it's still, you could say, oh, it's you such bellum, you're still working within fragmentation, but you could say, you know, it's, it's a particular, part of international law that carries or used to carry, I don't know if it carries anything anymore, but it used to carry a certain normative weight. I truly don't know if it carries anything. I'm, I'm not saying that flippantly. I'm very concerned about whether it does or it doesn't. But for me, that would be one maybe more systemic way of bringing these arguments together. Um, Neumann, thank you so much for mentioning Neumann. Obviously, he's all over this, right? And Neumann, <laughs> Was what the prosecution was written, right? It's well known that they were these copies of the behemoth going around the office of the prosecution. And this is what the tribunal did not even draw these distinctions that you're saying. The tribunal not just discards Neumann, it discards also a US capitalist tradition that is anti monopoly, right? It just the, the majority of the tribunal does not want to hear anything about the political role of cartels, whether it's Neumann or whether it's Brandeis, right? It just doesn't care about any of it. So it doesn't work with this distinction you allude to, and also it doesn't work at all with what I think is Neumann's very interesting challenge for international lawyers, which is to think, what is the state and who is the state? Right, because Neumann says, well, no, the bureaucrats, the, the people who would understand in law to be the state, which is the bureaucrats, were actually the last people calling the shots in the Third Reich. And he has, you know, the four categories, etc. But they are retreating from anything like this. It's like any idea that cartels and monopolies can be described as a political force is stupid and we will not entertain it. And when I'm saying that, these are pretty much, they do it in half a sentence. And the prosecution has these thousands and thousands of documents in which they're making the case. And the tribunal is like, no, that's nonsense. And they just move on. Um, the just war uh, thing. Yeah, I think just war theories tend to be uh, legitimizations of whatever the current 
water is. And as I said, I was particularly jumpy when Biden, and this has to do also with the domestic situation, but when Biden tried to say we need to keep fighting in Ukraine because the war creates good American jobs, one can support Ukraine's fight against what I think is transparently a case of aggression by Russia. I like one did not need to deny that in order to say I don't think that creating stimulus for the US economy should be part of the calculus. <laughs> and I think it is. And therefore, you cannot have these discussions by pretending they never said it because they did. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at Martin. It's gone two o'clock. Is there time for one more, what do you think? Martin? You can go on. Can fast. Okay, so if there's one or two more questions that anybody is burning to ask, Apparently not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, it remains me to thank you very much indeed. I'm sure everybody's going to agree that that was a really interesting, very important, very timely um, set of issues that I think will give us all a great deal of thought um, on the not just the political economy of the whole, but just the broader political framework in which um, things are happening uh, at the moment. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks for sharing. <laughs>